So, Ben. Yeah. Do you have the lights down? Do you have some candles lit? I have I have a skull on my desk, Zach. I'm going hardcore. I've got the I've got the shades drawn mostly because the wind the 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 sun comes in from that area and it or from that side. And so right at this moment of the day it gets really hot in here if I don't draw the um shutters. It's the actual shutters I've drawn. And on my desk I had found in um the cantina long ago a friend gave me a plaster cast of a human skull and i have placed that mm. on my desk do you and, find that um, the sun bothers you the sun bothers your eyes it just makes me yeah it makes me it burns me a little bit and it makes me angry i i i find myself hissing at it a lot which is weird right is that weird that's weird I don't think I've ever I don't think I've ever heard you hiss before. So, mm. um, but I, I have to ask if I've been have I been in bright light with you before? Um, but we're 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 creating this atmosphere because today's topic is of a dark diabolical nature, and I don't know about you, but in my research, um. Yeah, this is this is an interesting topic. This is a, a topic, and I think I had mentioned to you when we were chatting, I said that I came across some disturbing stuff, but not for the reasons that you might think. And I feel so this like it's gonna be a larger I, conversation. Right. And I know we haven't done a ton of pre-gaming with this one, but I feel I'm getting no. I got from what you said, I, I got the impression that we're ha- we're on slightly different pages uh or different uh um, I feel like we reacted to the subject a little differently because I'm raring to go because I found everything that I looked into just to be a tremendous amount of fun. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so like I just found it to be a, like an absolute romp. So I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I think this whole discussion is going to be, um, uh, it'll, it, there'll be a lot there, I think. Well, I think that it'll just show sort of like the wide range. But but so what are we what are we talking about today? Um, we are talking about uh, demons, the devil, devils. Yeah. Uh, the diabolic I- as monsters and in, and in stories. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I have found fascinating about this is demons and demonic presence activity the devil it's sort of this one thing that to this day it's something that you don't have to go far to find somebody who believes in the existence of demons you know you think about how long it would take for me to find somebody who believes in goblins or fairies or dragons or unicorns or 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 for that matter even 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 angels right but demons are this are this thing that even in the modern era it 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 squicks a lot of people out and i have found that fascinating um and again i'm going to kind of get into all of that <laughs> uh in the, <laughs> in the discussion today but demons have not been relegated to just the uh realm of folklore and fairy tale and mythology but but sure but within the realm of folklore and mythology and stories i feel like the demons and specifically the devil you know the great adversary i feel like the representation of that person or character is incredibly broad Mm -hmm. and that's i feel like that's that's um that's a little bit where my 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 direction went is the is the many different versions of of this one character that you that you find and to me that was one of the things that i found just delightful and so much of it depends on the people and the era in which uh sure he's yes existing. that's a big but, that's a big one that yeah. is a big one but uh well so Let's get right into it. So uh, let's just say that if you're somebody who is uh, easily spooked uh, or somebody who feels like they can draw dark energy towards them merely by speaking about it or listening about it, 
this may not be the episode for you. You may want to come back for the next episode. <laughs> but if you're feeling brave, oh. and if you are curious about what lurks in the dark depths of the human psyche, then listen on, dear listener. And then the rest of the episode should just be like dead air. I think that would be awesome. I was going to say to pull the curtain back a little bit. Uh, we 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 did have some technical issues before starting this episode. So that's true. I don't that's know. That's true. Then the devil's greatest the great, devil's greatest tool is 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 unbelief. Is is making sure nobody believes in him. That's right. That's maybe right. he's trying to. Maybe he's. Maybe through your fancy headphones, he is trying to stop us. Maybe that. Maybe those headphones came straight from hell. They are a little warm. And the guy was the, the delivery person. The delivery person was probably like, "Sign here." He had like a really pointy goatee, old scratch. <laughs> old scratch. Delivery. Okay, go for right. it. Let's go. Let's I'm, go. All right, I'm gonna flip my coin. Uh, I'll let you call it in okay. the air. You're gonna call either uh, Ewok or Duloc. Ready? Okay. Duloc. It's Ewok. So that means I get to Okay, choose. it's up to you. You're and, the choice man, okay. Uh, I'm going to choose that you go first. Here we go. All right, so I had said that I was interested in uh, different representations of the devil in stories. Um, and my first one, uh, stories in mythology and, and, and through history. And my first one is, I'm calling it the rustic devil of folk tales. Mm -hmm. um, this is, this is, this is, this is the devil you know, uh, who is adversarial, but he's an adversary. Uh, he doesn't have that galactic level final boss feeling. This is the devil from the devil went down to Georgia, right? Where this is the devil who, who could get drawn into a fiddle contest because he's he's behind on gathering souls, right? So a devil I, that, I love that a person could beat. Yes, it's a, it's a beatable devil, and it's a devil who always he's always he's wheeling and dealing. This guy, and he is he's always trying to do trade for a soul. And uh, sometimes he wins, sometimes he loses, sometimes he, he, people get in, in, in over their heads with him and are saved. But this is this is a kind of devil like in many of these tales. I mean, the tales aren't asking this question, but but well, devil went down to Georgia is asking this question. It's it, it mentions he's <laughs> he's way behind and he's looking for a soul. Right. So it's this guy. He's this devil Should we explain like, for for just for the poor soul that doesn't know what you mean by the devil goat went down to Georgia? Oh, devil went down to Georgia is a, uh, a country song. This is the one part I didn't uh, prepare for. Uh, let's see. Well, it's Charlie Daniels. Devil went down for. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm I'm finding it's a 1975 uh, 1979 uh, from a 1979 album. And the devil is, goes down to Georgia. He's way behind on souls. He gets into a fiddle playing contest with this kid. Um, what's the kid's name? Uh, I think Johnny. Yeah. Johnny. Johnny, yeah. play your fiddle hard, right? Yeah. And then like he bets a, a fiddle of gold uh, against his soul that he's a better fiddle player. And Johnny's just this just just amazing fiddle player. And uh, Johnny Johnny wins. And that's that's basically it. And, and the, the and but and there's also there's a meme online that I saw that, that just like I have to think about it every once in a while. And it's I think it's like one of those memes where like, you know, it's um it's a picture and it's been used for many different things. And it's a woman lying in bed and she's thinking with a man and she's thinking, I bet he's thinking about other women. Mm -hmm. And the man <laughs> is think and the man the man is thinking, okay, if the devil's in a one-on-one -on -one fiddle contest and an army of demons come up to accompany him. Doesn't that disqualify him? <laughs> and uh, when I when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, that's a good point. 
<laughs> he, was, he disqualified himself immediately. But this is the kind of devil that I'm talking about. And it, well, earlier this summer, I picked up a book called Il Diavolo Dietro Langbolo. So this is The Devil Around the Corner. And it is a collection of uh, devil and folklore uh, stories from, from this area. And I feel like it's, it's the same kind of, of devil. This is the same kind of story where we always have this guy, this devil, and he's, he's always leaping out or appearing. And he's like, got a deal for you. You know, like somebody's so it, like, he'll, he'll prey on people's needs that way. And then they, they either get out of it or they don't. So here's a couple of them. My, one, of, one of the good, here's a good, a good one is a good one that actually I found out is sort of almost pan-European is the devil's bridge. And there is a devil's bridge, uh, um, a Tuscany one about an hour from us that I might try to visit someday. But the Devil's Bridge story goes, well, you know, it goes, it's very, a lot of all these Devil's Bridge stories are very similar and they go something like this. Um, and they, these legends, they, they, like there's these wonderful arched bridges that they look very precarious and you're almost like, well, how do they stay up, right? And the story goes that there's, um, there are these workmen and they're trying to build this, they're this bridge and they're behind and they're worried about finishing on time. And the head head workman is like, we're not, we're not going to finish the contract on time to make this bridge. And the devil comes and he's like, well, I'll tell you what, I'll have this bridge fin finished by morning for you in exchange for the soul of the first uh, to cross it. And they're like, well, you know what? Okay. And they wake up the next morning, and the bridge is is all, goes all the way across the river. That that middle that thin middle bit has been finished, and uh, here comes a lady coming across the bridge. And at, as she's getting towards the bridge, she uh, ends up shooing a, a chicken ahead of her, oh. uh, and it ends up being <laughs> like the, the chicken is the first thing to cross the bridge, and the, the devil sees jumps out and seizes on this chicken, and then he's like, no. And he falls into the water, and and that's it. Poor guy. <laughs> and wow. um, so a lot of these, a lot, of, yeah. So a lot of these go like this, where the devil like makes this deal, and 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 his own wording isn't good enough to to seal it. Um, there's one in this book uh, called um, called Lana Nera. Um, which one is that? Uh, let me look at this. Can one. I just? Can I just go back for a second? I just wanted something that sure. sticks out to me in that story is um, I think right there, irrefutable proof that chickens have souls. Right. It's always, well, all these stories, sometimes they drive a dog across. Sometimes they do this knowingly. Sometimes it's just chance, but it's always an animal. And he always is trading for the soul of the first thing that goes across. So it's, it is, yeah, it, it implies that, uh, that these animals have souls. It's really that weird. Catholicism is wrong about animals and so <laughs> Well, yeah. Or the, when they do St. Francis's blessing of the animals, that's 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 awesome. Um, mm -hmm. So here's there's one about a uh, the 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 black ball of yarn, um, and there's this 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 young girl, and she's just impossible impossible to please. Her she's driving her mother crazy because she has all these suitors and she refuses them all until the day that this young and handsome man comes along and she's like this guy's perfect but he lives far away. And uh he takes her to his house and it turns out that, that she has married the devil and he says, "Well, you can open any window in this house except one." And you know, she explores this house and it's deep in the woods. And uh, one day he's like, well, I'm going to be out running around for the day. Um, you can just make sure not to open that window. And of course she opens the window. And when she opens the window, uh, it is a portal to hell and there's all the fire and everything. And she sees this other, this other girl and she's like, well, that's, that's my friend I used to go to school with. And her friend's like, I married this beautiful man and he turned out to be the devil. And now I'm here. And so it's a little bit like Bluebeard, right? It's finding the, uh, the uh, the previous wives in the cupboard, and she's like, I've got I've got to get out of this. I got to get back home to my family, and she makes it back home to her family. And it's so weird. Her mom is just like, well, she you get the impression she's like, brushes the flower off her hands, and she's like, I'm going to take care of this. And the devil comes, and he's like, I, I want my wife back. And she's like, you you have, um, you you have a proper claim to her, 
but you seem, but I know that you're so powerful. You have all these exceptional powers. I want you to turn this black uh, ball of yarn white. And the devil's like, oh, this is the, and, he, and then she's like, and if you, and, and, and if you aren't able to, then I will get to keep, um, keep our daughter here and, and you go away empty handed. And he's like, I don't even need to use my power for that. I can just wash it off in the stream. And he goes over to the stream and then it's like, well, the devil was very powerful, but he was not a zoological expert. And he didn't realize that there was this breed of that, that basically there are black sheep, right? <laughs> and it's, it's, he's like, <laughs> and so it's, it's so stupid because it's like, he thought it was like artificially tinted black and he could just wash it off. But no, it's actually wool from a black sheep. And the, try as he might, he couldn't turn it white. And so he, he goes away empty handed. And then, and then the bishop is like, we will gather a posse together and go and burn down the house that the, uh, that the devil is, is taking these women away from. Too, and they go all through the woods, but the house is gone. Um, so it's just, it's just, there's so these there, and there's so many of these. I, I, I'm, I can't go through them all in the, in the short time we have. Um, but there is one other one I want to tell. Oh, another one is another aspect of this devil though, is that he often appears in different guises and, and a lot of them are very unassuming. There's one where, um, this, uh, um, shepherd or a contadino runs on hard times and he is like well I've prayed to God and he hasn't helped me so now I'm going to go to the old pine forest and trade, pray to the devil and he's described when he appears as just being like just a thin spectacled man with shiny uh, buckles on his shoes not you know it actually says you know he's not goat legged or tailed or anything he's just this kind of unassuming fellow that comes out of the pine woods and and I liked that. So now we have one version where he's, you know, a handsome young man, one where, version where he comes out of the pine woods. And the, old, the one other one I want to tell you is the 12 truths. And um, and that one is one where there's a cloth merchant and he's getting older and selling less and less cloth. And and in this version, the de this guy comes to him and he looks like a uh, unassuming but very fine gentleman. And then of course it's the devil and he's like, I, if you want to sell all your cloth in one day and go away rich, well, uh, we, we can make a little deal. All you have to do is, you know, when I come around, if you can tell me the 12 truths, then, uh, uh, then that's fine. If not, then I'll, I'll get your soul. And he's like, well, that's, he says, I don't, I'm not very pious and I don't know the 12 truths, but I, my wife is, and she does. So if by the time he gets around to my house, uh, she'll be able to answer this for me. So he makes the deal, he sells all his fabric, and he goes away with a lot of money in his hand for the day, and he gets home, and um, his wife is like, what are you, I don't know the 12 truths, not by heart, what are you talking about? Um, and then there's a knock on the door, and there's this wayfarer, and they're just arguing about, you know, the 12 truths, and what they're going to do, and now they're really in trouble, and this guy comes in, this guy stops by at the door, and he's just... He's kind of like a vagabond and he's looking for a crust of bread and a plate of beans. And they're like, yeah, yeah, come in. Have a crust of bread and a plate of beans. It's fine. Then he sits down and he starts eating the crust of bread and the plate of beans. And they're still arguing about what are we going to do? Now you've gotten us really into trouble. And then comes the real knock at the door. And he's like, um, oh, the, the, the guy's name is, I think the guy's name is Felice. Uh, is that right? Yeah, a Felice. Mercante Felice. di Stolce. Felice, yeah. So he's like happy the merchant, right? And and they're arguing about this and it comes a knock at the door and it is the voice behind the door is like, now it's time to tell me the 12 truths. And they're like, oh no. And they turn toward the door and um, let me find the 12 truths. Hang on. I don't know the 12 truths by heart. Okay. So, so then from behind them, from at the table comes this voice, right? The, the first truth is the one of God who created the heavens and the earth. The second is the, uh, the, the baby and the cradle. The third is the three kings. The fourth is the four evangelists. And, he, and each time the devil's like the fifth. And he's like um, the, the seven tears of, of God. The sixth, the, se uh, the six uh, roosters of Galilee. The seventh, the seventh 
trials of Mary, the eight, the eight doors of Rome, all these the answers, right? Until he gets to the last, uh, the twelve, and he's like, "Those are the twelve apostles," and the and the the husband and the wife are just like frozen, like statues, and he's like, and the voice behind the door is like, "Well, I guess you you know won the deal," and he's all, and then they turn around and. Uh, to see the the poor vagabond who's answered the questions for them, and there's nothing, there's no beans, there's not a crust of bread, and there's just a spoon raised up in the air as if it was um, held up, and then it falls to the ground, and they're saved. And uh, very nice. This is this kind of this is the devil. This is the devil beaten, and this is the devil of folk tales where um, it always ends up being like normal people, and and win or lose, there's you know. There's always a chance, and sometimes it's their own folly that they're really fighting. So that is the rustic devil of folk, folk tales. I feel like the rustic devil. I, I actually I don't know, but we talked about old scratch. Old scratch being a, yeah. a, a a term for the devil. I feel like that's old scratch, right? He's he's the devil. It is. It's old scratch. That, yeah. That is, yeah, he's he's outwitted. Like you said, he's beatable. He's not sort of like an existential threat to the to the cosmos. Right. Um, and, and he's willing to make these deals, it seems like, because he's got like, he seems overworked himself. I feel a little bad for him, right? Like, <laughs> well, I mean, like you know, he's, he's probably got up. some some hubris and and that's his downfall. Right. Yeah, also, at times, too. he might be a little bit of a dummy. And it's it, it's like a lot of this is related to, to, to Faust, right? But mm-hmm. but Faust was, you know, a powerful magician or, you know, he's he's getting into deep knowledge and stuff. And this is the Faustian deal that goes with like normal people. I just love it. So for my first one, uh, so uh, this is this is a demon. Have you heard of the word or the name Baphomet? No. Okay. So Baphomet, um, I think uh, if if you haven't heard, if you can't identify the, the name Baphomet, Baphomet is um, sort of the stereo, uh, stereotypical, no, that's not the word I'm looking for. Um, the image of Baphomet is one that a lot of us are familiar with. Um, in fact, if you were to go to the uh, Satanic Temple, um, which is actually, there's one in Salem, Massachusetts, maybe about an hour and change away from where I am right now. Um, there will be a big statue of Baphomet there. So I'm going to, so Baphomet is, is not only is he a, a, a demon and a devil, but he's also associated with the occult. So you'll see his image on say like a lot of clothing, like black craft and things like that. And this, this image of Baphomet is actually widely attributed to a 1856 illustration uh, by Eliphas Levi. So the minute I start describing this, you'll, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. So Baphomet has a humanoid body. He has big wings. Usually they're, um, they're like a bird's wings or like a crow, like big black wings. He has a goat's head. All right. Is this starting to sound familiar now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he has usually a, a, a torch or, or some sort of flame in between his, his horns uh, he does have goat legs, and there is actually a really deep symbology to the way he is depicted, the way he is designed, and this is this is quite interesting. So, Baphomet, um, while referred to as male, uh, he does have female breasts. Um, instead of a wiener, he has a rod that symbolizes eternal life. And okay. one arm is male and one arm is female. I'm not too sure it's described that way. I, I don't know how it necessarily yeah, that's not, that's not looks that either, way. But okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't know. One hand has like really pretty long nails, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. so one arm is male, one arm is female. And one points upwards. And this is supposed to represent kindness and mercy. And the other hand okay. is pointed downwards and this represents judgment and justice. Um, on his forehead is a pentagram, 
And the pentagram itself is pointing upwards, and this is supposed to symbolize light. And the torch between his horns is meant to symbolize that the soul is above the material world, but still connected to it. Mm. And so really, Baphomet and the way he is designed, the way he's depicted, rather, is supposed to be a symbolic creature of balance. Mm. Well, suddenly this sort of takes it away from this like really demonic idea, right? Like mm -hmm. he is about the body and the soul. He's about mercy, but he's also about justice. Um, and I think that if you were to talk to people who are deep in the occult, uh, people who uh, identify as pagan or Wiccan, I think mm -hmm. this is a lot of what they would describe to you. Right, right, right. They're not just fans of like Freddy Krueger. <laughs> right. And and in fact, uh, there are many statues of him that actually have children next to him, mm. sort of like looking up at him in reverence. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I am not a theologian. Um, mm. So, you know, I would need in, in my research, I would need sort of more. I would need more uh, uh, guidance as to sort of where this actually fits into kind of the cosmology. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's funny that we so associate it with witchcraft. And I guess, I guess a lot of it depends, you know, is this demon evil? I guess that a lot of that depends on how you feel about witchcraft and the occult and, right. and things like that. Um, because certainly this idea of balance, you know, and, and again, the way he is depicted, uh, I mean, I find really interesting. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm going to start like having images of Baphomet around my house, but, um, you know, the fact that he has like an animal head, but a human body also, you know, again, it's that it's that balance. Right. Now, here's the other half of of Baphomet that I found really interesting. So so. And, and this is probably where a lot of the negative connotations of Baphomet uh, come from. Are you familiar with the Knights Templar? Oh, yes. So for, for those who aren't, the Knights Templar, uh, their, their, their full title is The Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon. Uh, they were a medieval military order of Catholic knights from 1119. And monastic, and somewhat monastic, right? Well, so they they were fairly secretive. This this is sort yeah. of the um, <laughs> this is sort of the strange dichotomy of the Knights Templar. Sure, sure. They were secretive. Um, certainly, um, historically, we know that their initiation rituals were secretive, similar to say like uh, the Freemasons or you know the the Skull and Bone, you know that kind of thing. But uh, they were also incredibly wealthy, and a lot of this came from their direct um, uh, influence and their direct participation in the Crusades. Right. Uh, they 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 were they were very wealthy. Uh, in fact, they developed <laughs> banking, <laughs> like a lot of concepts in banking that that we we still have today. Uh, they created a lot of infrastructure throughout not only Europe, but in the Middle East, the Holy Land. And they were, uh, many people actually consider them to be the first uh, multinational corporation. So then after the Holy Land was lost, uh, after the Crusades, the support for the Templars began to fade. In 1307, King Philip IV of France pressured the, the Pope of that time uh, to have the Templars arrested in something called the Inquisition of the Knights Templar. And uh, this was done, and the, the Knights were arrested and tortured, and they were tortured into confessing to worshiping Baphomet. So the, the narrative was that, oh, the, these supposedly holy order of knights were actually worshiping this devil named Baphomet the whole time. And they were they were burned at the stake for it. Now, there's there, there, there's two interesting things that you need to, to know about this. Other than that. So 
Baphomet is thought, the, the, the word, the name Baphomet is thought by scholars to be a corruption of an old French word, Mohammed. Oh, that makes some sense, especially for that time. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. So the old French word Mahomet right. is the French word for Muhammad. Right. Which these Knights Templar were in the Holy Land. Sure, sure. And there were lots of sort of scurrilous accounts about like, oh, well, I, you know, I heard them using this name, using this word uh, behind closed yeah, doors. Yeah, there's just a big mix of religious beliefs at that time in that place. A crossroads. Right. And the devil's always at the crossroads. Oh, very good. Nice. Um, but here, I think, is the other the other uh, uh, salient point of this whole story. Uh, so as I mentioned, the Knights Templar were were basically kind of like the first multinational international banking system in Europe. OK, and I'm sure this had nothing to do with the 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 Inquisition of the Knights Templar. But it turns out that King Philip IV was actually in a lot of debt to the Knights Templar. Ah, So I'm sure that that. I'm sure I'm sure that's just a coincidence. Right. Um, but the the bottom line is that this demonic entity known as Baphomet was used to destroy the Knights Templar. And in fact, the Knights Templar had been in charge of so much infrastructure that um, it actually really hurt Europe because all of a sudden you had all of these institutions that just were gone. That no one was there. Like, imagine, imagine if all of a sudden your local bank branch or whatever, just all of a sudden nobody was there and you couldn't access any of your money or mm -hmm, any of that. Mm -hmm. um, so in medieval Europe. So, yeah, it, it sort of plunged into almost like another a, a dark period of the Dark Ages. And so I thought that that was interesting. And this is going to be a thread in my other two demons as well that okay we'll talk about at the end but so that is baphomet uh and his connection with the knights templar and um the destruction of the knights templar although a lot of these secrets and the idea of the knights templar as a secret order they they still persist to this day oh yeah oh yeah um, the knights templar are like actually in last crusade right them. yeah indiana jones in the last crusade he was a knight he was like the last Templar, wasn't he? Uh, the guy they were that was crusaders. The they Holy weren't Grail. Templars. They were crusaders, the three brothers that came back. I don't think it says that they're Templar, but it really circles around that because there's also that other brotherhood of the, oh, brotherhood of the something cross. Traveling pants. Right? In Last Crusade. Yeah, but they're, 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 they're bound to keep the grail secret. Uh, so cool. But yeah, the Templars come up again and again and again. And there's I, I, I know there's also like people are still looking for Templar treasure. And uh it's good. And we watched, we watched, uh, we watched uh with Ronia and Julia and I watched um is it American Treasure, Nicholas Cage? Oh, uh National Treasure. National Treasure. National Treasure. National Treasure. Yes, with Nicholas Cage. And it's a ridiculous movie, but Oh, it is grade A ridiculous fun. Uh, if you're in the mood for something <laughs> like it, it's good. If you're not in the mood for something nice. like it, it's just the worst. Because um, it's, it's so silly. But also, like, he comes from a family that is traced back to the Templars. And the Templars then become the Freemasons. And they're, they're protecting this 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 treasure so vast that it would change the world if it was found. Oh, stuff man. Like Secret this. societies. Um, so yeah, yeah Templar is sure. definitely still with us. Secret society is all great, um, and that's that's really interesting about um, Baphomet and uh, uh, and, the, and the connections to Muhammad too. That's that's, that's interesting. Yeah, and me. so um, the the other thing, just just to wrap this up, or just just another little trivia point, and then we'll move on. Um, Apparently, the Knights Templar, I, I read something, there's a term for it, and, and this is terrible research because I can't remember the term, but uh, sure. there is a term that uh, if they were captured in the Holy Land or, or, or whatever, they were allowed to basically uh, perform this thing, this ritual or whatever, where they would 
they could pledge fealty to Mohammed, uh, to mm. their captors, but it was only verbally. It was not in their hearts. And uh -huh, so right. that sort of leads to some other stuff that where people said, oh, well, I heard them praying to Mohammed. It's like, well, right. for them, they were actually doing this activity where they were sort of, I mean, <laughs> basically lying, right? Like basically saying, like, Crossing oh, their yeah, fingers yeah, behind yeah. their back, basically. Yeah, right. But when you give it uh, when you give it a fancy religious type term, suddenly it becomes, uh, you know, not sure. crossing your fingers. Uh, but I thought that was interesting. <laughs> This is a good segue because we're going to be, um, uh, as you were talking about Baphomet, I was uh, trying to get the date on that. And it's, uh, it mentioned that, you know, with the Knights Templar, the Inquisition of the Knights Templar started in 1307. And we are going to be basically in the same zone with what I have to talk about, mm -hmm. which is Dante's Satan. So this is, this is Satan from, the divine, uh, from Dante's Inferno. Mm -hmm. From the Divine Comedy, and I really like this depiction of of Satan. It's very it's 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 rich. There's a lot there's a lot in it. But also, you know, at the same this is that exact time um, is when when he thirteen oh eight you know to thirteen twenty is when when Dante is exiled from Florence and starts working on this uh, this incredible. Uh, epic poem um, that has become, you know, a canon of of world literature, and uh, in that last, in that ninth circle of hell, that is reserved for uh, the the traitors, and uh, you, um, you know those. I don't know, but anyway, Mahad is, is is in amongst them for you know splitting the Christian world in some way. Uh, so he's he's mentioned as being in that in that circle, but what I like about this is that when they reach this last circle of hell, um, we find a very very different Satan from. Once again, we find this this is a different, a vastly different incarnation than the rustic devil of folk tales, and also from the, you know, like I said, galactic level final boss Satan, right? The Satan of of. Even the Satan of, um, you know, the satanic panic or the Satan that can, like, just rip you apart. This is a Satan who is encased chest deep in ice in the middle of a frozen lake, trapped, unmoving. Um, and he's a giant. He's like five stories tall. Nipples perpetually hard. Very much, yes, with these bat wings that are blowing uh, wind across the frozen lake ice, continually freezing all the other traitors. This Satan has three faces, uh, a black face, a red face, and a yellow face, and each one of the heads is chomping on a traitor. So one head has Judas, one head has Brutus, and the other one has Cassius, So, which is something so weird to me, except that, that you know, the classical word, this is, you know... This is like some of the stuff that read, led to the Renaissance. So there is the um, fascination with the classical. Uh, but it is, it is to, to modern ears, it's funny to have, uh, you know, Judas there. And then two of the guys who orchestrated the killing of Caesar, right? <laughs> um, like the other two are the guys who orchestrated Julius Caesar's death, right? Um, uh, so his wings be are beating cold air across the ice, freezing all the traitors. This is... Um, he, he was cast out by God and, and he actually, the, the pit that he's in is um, like, it's the first like uh, physical description of how all this worked, right? Like it's, he's not on another, this, this hell isn't on another plane. This is a descent into earth. And this pit is the pit that, that he landed in, right? Like a meteor. And so in this version, the, the mountain of purgatory is all, and this is earthly, and it's all that displaced earth. That's what created this, like, created Mount Purgatory, right? And he's just sitting in there in the middle of this pit. And he's, this is what's, um, what's so very poetic and descriptive of this is the, um, the, the impotence of, of, of this, of his, 
the turning away or the evil, the impotence that it led to. He's he's mindless. He doesn't speak. He just slobbers and chews on these traitors. And in all six of his eyes are weeping. And so there he is in the middle <laughs> pit of hell, just weeping and chewing on craters, frozen up to up to his chest in ice. Except that apparently he can get up get, get up and around that because Dante and Virgil, and this is the first part where Dante is, he's like looking away. He can't he can't go on, and but they do go on, and they climb on his hairy flanks. Uh, they climb like down. Um, now I'm getting now I'm getting it mixed up how this works because it's all very odd and confusing because in this moment. They start climbing on his hairy flanks, and the, when they reach his junk, gravity f- shifts around, and now they're climbing up, Whoa. right? So right at his midsection, um, everything changes around, and then they, they, they are climbing up, and um, the time of day sort of changes, too, and Dante's all confused about this, and Virgil's like, well, no, we, now we've gone through the center of the earth. And we're coming up in the southern hemisphere. So we're, you know, the sun has changed place and gravity has changed place. Which is so weird for 1308, right? Um, right, yeah. For 1308 to be like, okay, at the center of the world, gravity flips and you're going the other way. That is, first of all, yet another um, reminder that, yes, people knew the world was round. Right. <laughs> Right, yeah. and it's also it's also um, what well, C.S. Lewis calls it the first um, science fiction special effect. Right, so this idea of like mm. looking looking mm-hmm. at the physical world and creating a sort of weird special effect based on it. So so C.S. Lewis pegs Dante as, as doing that first with his Satan as they climb up his um, hairy body, and. Um, and yeah, that's I just think I just think he's really cool and I like the 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 idea that this is not a Satan that can get in your mind. This is a Satan that um he has created hell just by falling. Like not yeah. by being lord. And of he's hell. just kind of stuck down there, right? Yeah, he's just stuck down there like like suffering along with the sinners, suffering his own punishment and being lord of hell just means he was the 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 big rock that fell there and created it. Right. It kind of reminds me of the uh, Persian myth that I talked about in our in our uh, rule of threes episode, the uh, mm. the Zahak. Yeah. Um, where he was also placed like under a mountain, just trapped and and, yeah. and waiting. Just and waiting. So that that concept of like the great evil trapped under either you know, in the center of the earth or under a mountain or, you know, it's, it's interesting how that seems to persist yeah. throughout um, different human, human cultures. But you get the impression that this Satan isn't even waiting. He's just, he's just there, just pr- kind of for all eternity, like impotently chewing on, you know, some, some of these guys. And there's also, but the, also the, the, the physicality of it, the sort of the physics of it, actually, the the like it's taking it's taking a, um, a theology that everybody believes in and giving it like a physical real world um, location. And and, you know, like this idea of actual displaced Earth makes a pit and and then mountains on the side. Um, there is a weird connection and I can't. This is just my own odd connection well, according to Daniel Borstein's the, the Discoverers, uh, Columbus's journals have him, even when he was, you know, he'd made his voyage. By his third voyage, he still wasn't convinced that he, um, of quite where he was and was looking. Mm-hmm. And, and when he reached like, oh, what was it, like the Orinoco River, he was looking, he, he still kind of thought he might have found Eden, basically. The, the the first land that people came from, which was supposed to be sort of like a, a, like this high mountain, like so high that it was, well, in his journals, again, according to Daniel Borstein, he describes the earth as it's shaped like, like a woman's breast, right? With this big nipple of land coming up that you could actually find and that, mm-hmm. that's, and that that's where 
the uh, the original, you know, garden that, that Adam and Eve were cast out from existed. So you do have these medieval maps yeah. that kind of revolve around um, that actually physically existing on Earth. So there's this like weird precarious time in history where, you know, there's this burgeoning age of discovery, but there's also this real push to tr- figure out how our, how the the physical theology fits into it. Mm. But just th- just gave people a lot of like ideas that at the time probably seemed very sensible, but in retrospect seemed just incredibly odd. Does that make sense? Mm. <laughs> yes. I don't know. Maybe we maybe we cut this part out with <laughs> Christopher Columbus. We'll see. But that is. Okay. Um, <laughs> But that is that is Dante's frozen Satan uh, sitting there in the middle of the ninth circle. It sounds like a it sounds like an ice cream stand. Dante's frozen Satan. Dante's frozen Satan. You want to go for a Dante's frozen Satan? Do you have a book? Do you have a recommendation? Because I have one. If you go, um... uh, you go this time. I do not. Okay, so. I don't have a book recommendation, but what I do want to recommend uh, is this YouTube channel that I recently discovered and I I shared with you called Esoterica. (gasps) I love Esoterica. Uh, So this is so Dr. Justin Sledge is the uh, the the guy he is. He is Esoterica and he is a theologian, uh, philosophy all this kind of stuff, but he specializes in the arcane and the occult and religion and its connection to society and people. And he has done all these fantastic videos. Uh, The one that I initially found was the video he did on the satanic panic for those of us who, you know, basically the satanic panic from the mid seventies through to the mid to late nineties. And I find that he is really good at connecting so much of this stuff of like, you know, Hey, these things that happened in medieval times are not that different from these things that are happening today. Kind of thing. He takes a very, Oh, how would I describe it? He takes a very kind of grounded approach at these mystical and arcane subjects. And and I find that that's like right in my, that's right up my alley. It's right in my wheelhouse. Mm. And he's, he's incredibly educated and smart. And well, like I said, he's a doctor. Um, But yeah, so again, the YouTube channel is Esoterica and I, I highly recommend it. Uh, I have found every video I've watched of his, I have found uh, to be, both entertaining and informative. And he's got such a nice measured approach. You see his, his presentation is very calm and clear. I, I, I Thank you for passing him along. I, I've enjoyed them too. So yeah, so that is, that is my recommendation. We should, I don't know, maybe we can get him on the show someday. Ooh. All right. Uh, so continuing on. So uh, I'm actually going to flip my list here. So the one I was going to do second, I'm actually going to do last okay. because uh, this one, this one I I found, this is the one that I found disturbing, but not for the reasons that you might think. And so I want to end on sort of a slightly more positive one. Mm-hmm. But uh, so this one is, <laughs> this one is the evil demonic deity of the ancient Phoenicians called Moloch, Moloch. or in some texts he's Molech. Are you familiar with Moloch? I know of Moloch, but but you're going to tell me so much more. Okay. So uh, as I said, Moloch uh, was a demonic deity of the ancient Phoenicians. The Bible calls the Phoenicians the Canaanites. Am I saying that right? The Canaanites? Mm -hmm. Canaan? Yep. Yeah. And so this is sort of like modern day, what is it, like Lebanon? Like it's like the Near East, um, I don't know, sort of like the right side of the Mediterranean there. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the area, part of the world that we're looking at. So Moloch is a giant uh, bronze or iron idol. He has a bull's head with three eyes. 
and he has huge arms and hands that are outstretched. And in his belly is a cavernous furnace. Uh, and this is used to to heat the idol up. Last time we talked about Talos being heated up. Uh, Moloch gets heated up uh, as well. Moloch, so so Moloch's sort of personality is is mostly described actually in Paradise Lost. And something that I found is that a lot of these named devils and demons, they come from, some of them are kind of like briefly mentioned in the Bible. A lot of them come from Hebrew, like demonology and that kind of thing. But a lot of them, their personalities are developed in works of literature like Paradise Lost, like Dante's Inferno, like, mm. you know, Faust and Goethe and all of these these guys. So so really kind of a little more recent in the grand scheme of things. But Moloch is thought to be one of the baddest dudes uh, fighting alongside Satan. In fact, he was the one that told Satan he was like, screw this. Let's take the fight to God right now. Um, and he he kind of got outvoted. But that should give you a little bit uh, mm -hmm. of insight into into who Moloch is. So what Moloch is most known for is people basically Romans, things like that, accused the Phoenicians of child sacrifice. And the this was a sacrifice that was done to Moloch. So the idea is that this giant iron and bronze idol was heated up from the inside and the infant would be placed in the idol's hands uh, it would be anointed with oils and herbs by the priest and would be placed in the idol's hands and the infant would burn up instantaneously in a burst of, of white ash. You know, I mean, a truly horrible practice. And, mm -hmm. and, and it is. And I will and, and we're going to kind of circle back to that. So the term Moloch, uh, you can still encounter it today. A lot of times it's described as anything that's sort of a big sacrifice or anything that requires a lot to be put into it. In fact, there was actually a news article a long time ago where uh, cars, <laughs> the automobile, was referred to as the modern Moloch. Oh, uh, right. Okay, um, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of modern day theologians and and... and learned people actually think that the word Moloch is a corruption of the Punic word Mlech, which is mm -hmm. the word for sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So the idea that many people have is that rather than this being a demon that people were sacrificing their children to, um, this was, you know, an idol of a God that they were just making general sacrifices to, um, which most primitive cultures have done, mm -hmm. whether, you know, it's a goat or whether it is a symbolic kind of thing. There's also, um, I watched a really great documentary on this again from archeologists trying to determine whether or not the Phoenicians actually sacrificed children to Moloch, because much like what I talked about with the Templars, the idea of child sacrifice was really pushed by by Christians who were trying to demonize literally uh, Phoenicians, right. particularly now. Remember, the Romans and the, like, you know, the Christian Romans, and that kind of thing. They wiped the Phoenicians off off the face of the earth. Right. Like they they obliterated the Phoenicians. And remember, as we know, history is always written by the winners. Anytime you're trying to other somebody, what do you want to do? Well, you want to accuse them of just the worst possible crimes against humanity. And what is the worst possible crimes against humanity that you could think of? Sacrificing your children, willingly sacrificing your children to some deity, right? Most humans would agree that that is a, 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 an awful practice. But whether or not it's actually true, 
most historians and archaeologists lean towards no. And the reason is because um, I guess there there are some like texts or whatever saying specifically that they would sacrifice their their male children. But uh, they have found these urns in these sort of Phoenician uh, graves with with the remains and they have found both male and female remains. So mm-hmm. that sort of takes out the idea that there was there was a you know that it was sort of a ritual mm-hmm. you know that the idea that just the male children were being sacrificed um <clears throat> and also there's also the idea that um this wasn't sacrificial but in fact this was a funeral practice mm. but again you know it's one of those things where it's like you know, we, we may never know. Right. Now I had mentioned that I had mentioned that, uh, I found this disturbing and not for the reason that you think. So is it disturbing the idea? You know, it's, it conjures this image, right. Of this, you know, this, this primitive culture, uh, worshiping this demonic deity that requires their most precious resource and sacrifice. But what I find most disturbing is that that idea persists till today and it persists till today sorry i'm gonna get political (laughs) uh qanon yeah right so so this is when when you hear far-right people talking about how the left and democrats are uh led by or or are themselves rather child traffickers uh you know, eating babies. I mean, this this is a real thing that people have put out there, right? Like it's not it's not hyperbole, it's not metaphor. This is a real thing that certain far, far gone groups believe that, you know, Hillary Clinton eats babies and Barack Obama eats babies and all this kind of stuff. And it is directly tied to this cult of Moloch. The really disturbing thing for me was, you know, I had encountered Moloch in um, a book that I recommended actually uh, a few episodes back that is just sort of a dictionary of lots of different mythological creatures. So I had originally found him in there. When I went online and went to Google Moloch, Mm -hmm. I am I am upset and disturbed at how far down I had to go in the results to find okay, what is the mythological origin? Like, who is Moloch as a mythological creature? Because most of the results that came up were preachers and and religious leaders talking about the cult of Moloch and how the cult of Moloch has infiltrated, uh, you know, American government and, and the highest echelons of the American elite. Mm-hmm. And this is and this is today. This is today that this is happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, just looking at the history of it and realizing like, but you realize how this demon was used to demonize people that one group of people wanted to defeat. Again, right. same as the Knights Templar. Right. Um, but, you know, it's... Um, you know, I talked about esoterica and he talks about, he doesn't talk about Moloch specifically, but he, again, he talks about like in the satanic panic about how it's the same thing, medieval times, the Salem witch trials. And then to today you accuse a group of people of terrible crimes that nobody would uh, ever defend. <laughs> right. And you use that to, to destroy them. Attributed to a strange, the worship of a strange God. Yeah. Hmm. On the bright side, <laughs> also in my, in my uh, research, I have not watched all of it, but I did begin it. Uh, we talked about our, <laughs> our favorite silent movie, Der Golem. Yes. Well, there is, well, I think that you'll like this. There is an Italian silent movie and nice thing about uh, silent movies is it doesn't matter what language they were originally filmed in. (laughs) Uh, Not that it would matter for you, but there's an Italian silent movie from 1914 
called Kabiria. And you can it's on YouTube. I'll I'll send you the link. Okay. Um, but it is about a little girl named Kabiria, and it involves Moloch. And what's great is there's these fantastic set pieces with this idol built. And apparently the idol from that movie actually is still in um I don't know if it's in Italy. I'm not okay. sure where it is, but I know it like it still exists as like an art piece. Oh. And um even if you just Google Kabiria, okay. uh, it'll pop up and it's 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 really cool. And so I started to watch it. I didn't finish it yet. Okay. Is it a story of long ago or is it a story that takes place, you know, in nineteen fourteen? No, it's 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 from long ago. Like it's about okay. um it t- it starts out on in on Sicily, okay, and uh, Mount Etna exploding okay. and things like that. So yeah, so it does not take place in 1914. Okay, okay. Um, and if you look at the picture of the the Moloch idol, it's like a super like D and D. Like it looks like the cover of the original player's handbook. It's oh, cool. Awesome. <laughs> cool, 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 cool. That's a good. So one. yeah, so that's Moloch. And like I said, just sort of the disturbing fact that uh, belief in Moloch still exists in order yeah. to destroy people that another group of people. Yeah, don't, and it seems uh, like in some circles a somewhat literal belief, which is which is odd. It's an absolutely literal belief because we say, I mean, like on the one hand, you can say, you know, you can. It's it's crazy how far down in the search results you have to go when you type in Samaritan, you know, it's all these stories of the good Samaritan, but it gets, takes so long to get to actual Samaria, right? Or, or whatever it is. But, and you could say the same thing for Moloch, right? The, the sort of literary interpretation of it has maybe, uh, I don't know, subsumed the, 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 the historical, but, but this seems like a very, this seems like a disturbingly literal um, uh, interpretation or belief in in this that that people are actually worshiping this god who is still with us or this yeah. this demon who is still with us. Crazy, right? Crazy, crazy. People are crazy. There's also um, Bohemian Grove. Is that is that is that a is that is there are there any Moloch conspiracies? Uh, with Bohemian Grove, the the one world. I government. did watch a video about Bohemian. I did watch. I did watch uh, a video about Bohemian Grove. And do they get into? Moloch I think there is a documentary they... about Bohemian Grove. Okay. Okay. That was. I a don't big know one. that. I don't. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know enough about it. I don't think that it's Moloch. I think it's okay. A Just that owl demon, because I think that one was described as being an owl. Yeah. 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 It's um, an owl demon. Anyway, that one's a real. That was a big conspiracy theory. Google Bohemian Grove. I was s- s- kind of stumped on what my on what my third uh, what my third one was going to be, and once again I find myself in debt to my friend Gwen for leaving her fairy tale and folklore research books in this house. They've been sort of an unending source of inspiration because I really quickly decided that yes I'm going to do the you know. The rustic folklore devil, and I was like, "Of course, thank I'm you, do Gwen. Dumb. Thank you, Gwen. I've said it before. I will surely say it again." And I was very quickly interested in doing um, uh, Dante's Dante's Frozen Satan, but the last one, I I found myself. I picked up a book uh, called the Pentameron uh, that she had left here. And it was it's a 17th century Neapolitan fairy tale collection by a poet and courtier named Gian Battista Basile or John Baptist Basil, I guess is <laughs> how we'd say. So um, and, and it was it's fun. It's, it's it's you know, it's a fairy tale collection. And, and then but there were these illustrations uh, by an artist named Michael Ayrton. And um, I like them immediately. They're loose, um, loose pen and ink line work, kind of, kind of, kind of sexy and nice, and just lot, like really mythical, 
really liked everything that was going on. So I looked him up because this guy is obsessed with flight. He's, he's, uh, I mean, he died in the seventies, so he's, he's much more recent. Uh, but he was obsessed with flight. What's his name again? Michael Ayrton. Um, and he, if you look him up, you'll, you'll find the first thing you'll find of him is, is a Minotaur statue because he was also a sculptor and a painter and he loved the Minotaur and Daedalus and, um, mazes and myths. Oh, and wow. Yeah. He's so cool. And as I was reading about him, I, I heard, I wrote, I saw that he wrote a novel about a little devil called Titibulus. Uh, so this is Titibulus or <laughs> Titibulus. There's different spellings of of this little guy. Um, And his novel is called Titivulus or The Verbiage Collector. And I was like, what is, what is this? And Titivulus is first mentioned in like 1285. uh, And he is, he works for Belphegor, 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 the demon of discoveries. So Belphegor is in our dictionary infernal. Um, which which has those which we've talked about before and has these marvelous illustrations and is from the 1800s or whatever, but collects some of these old uh, the names of these older deities that, or de- devils and gives them sort of like personalities and is a so one of the sources for uh, they all have the, seals and symbols seals and symbols and kind of Gary Gygax pulled from a little bit of this for the. The demons in the monster manual, stuff like this. But Belphegor, Belphegor is this demon of discoveries, but prideful discoveries. These like inventions and things that can, um, uh, I don't know, I don't know, knowledge and thing, all those terrible things. Uh, anyway, but I love Titibulus. I love this little, little, more of an imp. And he collects in a sack on his back um, idle chatter. Uh during church services <laughs> he collects mispronounced oh. mum- mumbled or skipped words in prayers even slurred syllables uh he introduces errors into the works of scribes uh he also he even collects syncopated syllables from like the choir right if they're if they miss beats and stuff like that or like put the syllable in the wrong place wow, this sounds so yeah. phantom toll boothy in which you, so you talked great. about the phantom toll booth and yeah and he even appear and he's very small he bears and he there he, he's appears in a in a Hieronymus bosch painting of of john the evangelist uh or john the evangelist uh, um like as if he's going to like like tip over the ink bottle um and that's that's in like the 1500s so it's just, he's just he's fantastic because it's this like it's yet another um sort of vision of hell so we have like uh the vision of, like like the like the rustic devil who's like got to trade for a soul. He's always behind. He can't really just take your soul. He's got to trade you for it. Then we have like uh, Dante's enormous mountainous Satan who's just completely trapped and encased um, and kind of har- like, like not harmless, but, but he's done. There, there's nothing more to, for him to be except trapped in this thing. And then we have this myopic um, little uh, sort of a, uh, underling of hell who's collecting just the most ridiculous minutia right of life all the little the the, <laughs> the smallest little little slight missteps during church services and stuff like this and um he cried so titibulus to me um cries out for uh for as much as any of these for an illustration i, I just I really, really like. I was going to say, I can't wait. He's got to have like, yeah, he's going to have like really, really thick glasses. You know, like very small with big, big glasses, looking (laughs) for those words. Um, Anyway, that's short. He's like the um actually devil. He's the um actually devil. Yeah, yeah, and it's like (laughs) just Um, everything. Actually, it's pronounced. (laughs) <laughs> and then he puts the, he puts your wrong version in his sack. He's just like kind of weighed down by this sack of syllables. So that's it. That's the that's the whole deal. I just I just loved everything about the the concept. Um, just tickled me. That's really cool. That's that's a good that's a good find. I love these. I love the idea of these sort of very minor 
like you said, imps and devils and, you know, the, the underlings. Yeah, yeah. And you can see why Hermes Bosch, like, like seized on this. Like, like I said, he's been around since at least, like, you know, the, the 11th century. And then here we have Hermes Bosch a couple hundred years later being like, oh, there, that's one for my painting. This is my, uh, this is the third one, and this is the last one. Hmm? You, you know this, and, and, and I think most people know this, even if they're not uh, of this particular faith. But uh, so the Hebrew God, right? He creates the world, and he creates the plants, and he creates the animals, and he needs something to take care of the plants and animals. So what does he do? I'm quizzing you. What does he do? What does he create after that? Oh, what? After the plants and the animals? Yeah. Uh, what comes next? Man. Yeah. So out of the out of the earth, out of the mud, he creates Adam. Right. And then after that, out of the earth and the mud, he creates Lilith, woman. Right? You yep. do that, right? Yeah, yes, yes. Adam and Lilith. Yes. We always we always hear about uh the first man and the first woman, Adam. It's and not Lilith. Adam, it's yeah, it's not Adam and Steve, it's Adam and Lilith. That's the same, <laughs> right? Isn't that the same? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. It's not Adam and Billeth. It's Adam <laughs> it's and Lilith. Not Adam okay. and Billeth. <laughs> that's, a, that's a better one. That's a better one. FYI, we love our LGBTQ friends and and colleagues, and that's just making fun of people who say that. Not make anyways. So he <laughs> creates Adam and he creates Lilith, the first man and the first woman to hang out together and take care of the plants and the animals. Well, almost immediately, Adam and Lilith don't really get along. They 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 kind of start clashing, and. Uh, Basically, it comes from this. Adam is like, well, you know, I was created first, so I should be in charge. I, I should be the head of the household. And Lilith has this really independent streak, and she's like, screw that. Like, God created you out of the earth in his image, and he created me out of the earth in his image. So what's the difference here? Why should you be in charge? And so they're, they're clashing about this and, and even more so their sex life is not great. Um, it is a real sticking point in their, in their relationship. Uh, and, and, and this is, this is spelled out in no uncertain terms within the, the folklore. Basically it comes down to neither one of them wanted to be, uh, on the bottom, shall we say. Hmm. They both had a right to be on top. They, neither one needed to be on the bottom. Well, Finally, Lilith has just had, she's had it. And so in anger, she takes the ineffable name, which uh, I had to look up. I mean, that's basically taking God's name in vain, but it's, it's in this version, it's specifically, you know, Yahweh. And I'm not exactly sure. Wait, what, back up a minute. She says the ineffable name. That's the thing that she does. Okay. Right. And so uh, like a lot of old writings and stuff there, there's a lot of murkiness here um right. but so she takes the ineffable name in anger and in doing so uh she actually like transforms and becomes a demon it, really it, she kind of sprouts wings which is kind of rad and she oh. flies off so adam adam goes to god and tells god that his girlfriend just got mad and flew away God says, oh, all right. He's like, I'll, I'll just sit tight. I'll, let me see what I can do. So God sends three of his angels, and these angels are named. They're named Senoi, Sansanoi, and Samangaloth. Oh, Samangaloth. That's a good one. Samangaloth. Yeah. Senoi, Sansanoi, and Samangaloth. So he tells these three. I mean, <laughs> I sort of imagine them as like maybe like the three stooges or something. I don't know. Hmm. Anyways, so he tells these angels, he says, look, go find Lilith. Tell her that if she comes back of her own accord, all is forgiven. It's like nothing ever happened. She never took the ineffable name and she can live in Eden and, and it's all good. 
But if she decides that she doesn't want to, she can have her freedom. She can be independent, but she's going to become the mother of demons and a hundred of her children will be slain every day. So the angels go and they, they catch up with Lilith over the Red Sea and they, they, Hey, look, uh, God's got a deal before you run away. Just, just hear us out. And so Lilith says, I'm going to read this part. She says, leave me. She said, I was created only to cause sickness to infants. If the infant is male, I have dominion over him for eight days after his birth. And if female, for 20 days. So, again, murkiness. It's like these are the first two people. They haven't even had children and she's already thinking. Anyways, <laughs> best not to best not to, to, to question. Just kind of go with it. So when the angels heard Lilith's words, they insisted she go back. But she swore to them by the name of the living and eternal God. Whenever I see you or your names or your forms in an amulet, I will have no power over that infant. Basically, she's like, look, I'm not coming back to Eden. I will be the mother of demons. I'm still going to go mess up other weak people and infirm people and children. But... I'm not totally beyond reason. If somebody puts an amulet on an infant with one of those angels' names, it'll remind Lilith of her oath and the infant will be protected from her. So this was a practice uh, for a long time of, of putting, again, either the form or the name of an angel on an infant. Again, first eight days for a boy, first 20 days for a girl. Uh, to protect them from from Lilith. So later on, uh, God creates Eve from Adam's rib. And I think that this is sort of an important, you know, I think a lot of the sort of stories of Genesis, they, they kind of leave out Lilith or they don't kind of acknowledge that. But I think this is a really interesting concept. So the idea that Lilith being created just in the same way that Adam was, but she's independent. Eve being created from Adam's rib kind of solidifies her subservience to Adam, right? So Eve is sort of like, she's much less independent. Lilith is now fully considered uh, a demon and she decides that she's going to mess up things with Adam and Eve. And so the idea is that her being female as well, she knows how Eve thinks and she knows what to say to manipulate her. And that knowing Adam the way she does, she knows what buttons to push to get to Adam. Um, and so there are versions of the story that say that Lilith coaches the serpent into what to say mm. to tempt them into eating the apples. And there are also even other versions. And apparently there's even um, a painting by Michelangelo of this where Lilith actually is the serpent. Mm. Um, this painting actually is like shows this serpent in a tree. It's sort of like her with like the rather than legs, she kind of has the back half of a serpent. Um, and so the idea is like, I'm going to screw this up for you. I'm going to have you guys, you know, I'm going to be the one that tempts you into eating these apples yeah. as opposed to, you know, the devil or Satan, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so obviously we know how that ends. They eat the apples, they get thrown out, all that kind of stuff. Um, something that I found really interesting in this, this tale, this version, this story is it's clear to see why and how Lilith kind of has become a feminist icon. You know, mm -hmm. we have like the Lilith fair and stuff mm -hmm. like that because, you know, this whole idea about her being independent from, you know, and not being subservient to, to men, that kind of thing. But I think it's more complex than that because if you think about both Adam and Lilith, Lilith Although she becomes a demon and has this, this terrible curse, right, where a hundred of her children will be slain every day, 
she has her freedom. She has her independence. Right. Uh, and in fact, it, it's even important to sort of note that in her infraction against God, God is still willing to negotiate with her, right? Like right. God sees that she's independent and independent minded, and he's willing to kind of sit down and say, hey, look, let's figure out a solution and 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 gives her her choice. Um, it's easy to sort of think like, oh, well, in this situation, you know, uh, uh, Lilith gets gets the short end of the stick and becomes this horrible person. And Adam, you know, kind of gets everything. But that's not true either, because Adam in his infraction against God, he just gets kicked out immediately. Right. Like there's no negotiating. Right. With yeah. with Adam over that. It's just, hey, look, you did this. Boom, you're out. Now, you know, you're naked and cold and all that kind of stuff. So I think that looking at the the, the complexity of it um, is sort of interesting and kind of this idea that had the two of them in the beginning been able to compromise, they both kind of would have been able to stay happy in Eden. Um, and so, you know, again, like I said, it's, it's, I found the complexity of that story, the sort of clear, you know, like I said, uh, obviously a clear feminist kind of, uh, 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 idea to it, but also kind of looking at it and going, well, it's not that simple to say that, well, of the two Lilith got the shaft and Adam got everything because that is not true either. Adam lost just as much as Eve and in fact didn't even get the um, sort of the chance at redemption that Lilith was originally given, even though she chose her own way. And, you know, that sort of speaks a lot to independence and and choice making and that no matter what choice you choose, it's also good to be given that choice. Mm. Um, so I, yeah, so I found it really interesting. Um, other things in terms of Lilith and this idea of Lilith there. So we first see mentions of Lilith in Mesopotamian mythology, where okay. she is closely associated with being like a bird. So not being a bird, but, but like there are a lot of versions Almost every version sort of uh, uh, depicts her or describes her as having wings. Sometimes she has bird's feet. And then there are some scholars that actually say that the word Lilith in very, very early versions of the Bible is actually a word for a screech owl. And Ooh. so like Lilith is kind of mistranslated. So rather than being an actual demonic entity, it's, it's just a screech owl. Um, because it's like described as living in this desert with like wild cats and, and things like that. Um, and then through the ages, Lilith sort of, again, it, it depends on, on what era we're talking about, who the, the teller of the tale is. Um, sure. but yeah. she's, she's seen as being somebody who deliberately, you know, sort of comes after children like there there are versions that say that she couldn't have children and so she tries to kidnap other children oh. um there are versions where she is a temptress uh we talked about the succubus that she's basically a succubus oh okay. um and and again versions where she has either bird-like qualities or snake-like qualities things things like that so there there are several different versions but it's important that throughout every version, she is not viewed uh, favorably. Mm. She's always somebody who is is trying to do harm of some kind. So that's what I that's what I learned about Lilith. Mm. And like I said, had Adam and Lilith kind of been able to work things out instead of making demands that the other one behave a certain way, uh, things may have who been knows different. where we'd be. Yeah. That's interesting. I like it. Again, so much, so much of this stuff is is murky, either through bad translation, missing texts, you know, things like that. Um, and evolution, story evolution, and and such. 
which which is what I was thinking is this like um to me in a certain way it enriches some of the um it enriches the Genesis story to have another player, right? If you think of stories as being um how we think and how like a you know a metaphorical way of talking about ourselves um having this extra player in 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 a version of the very first chapter of of the people story uh it makes it interesting yeah it's it, it enriches it enriches right. that it enrich it gives us another tool to talk to talk about uh and and you know the the relation between the sexes and and, and stuff like this it's uh it's just another right. game. And, and relationships and, yeah. um, you know, the other thing that I find interesting about this story, um, and I suppose you could say this for anything, is um, thinking back to your, your rustic devil. The god in this version is not, is, is obviously not a totally omniscient, omnipotent, uh, right being like this is a this is a god that um if not made mistakes is at least was not sort of able to foresee certain things right right. um i mean i suppose you could argue god works in mysterious ways but it's sort of like you know this is somebody that that stuff outside of his control seems to happen you know, mm. Lilith escapes. Well, if he knew that was going to happen, well, why'd he do it? Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it, it's a little more in line with sort of pre monotheistic Christianity where, you know, I mean, you know, nobody would say that Zeus was infallible. <laughs> Certainly not. Right. Nobody would say Odin was infallible big cosmic existential beings versus right. um, kind of bringing them down a little bit, bringing them a little bit closer maybe to, mm-hmm. to humanity. Mm-hmm. So I think that's our demon episode. Yeah, I think, I think it is. I think um, we covered a, an awful lot and I thought, yeah, like my, my, my closing thought, is just it is, is a, my closing thoughts are about a lot how, a, a lot about how how different all these stories are. Um, the one the mm. one I think we didn't get to, except we touched on it lightly with Lilith, was because I'm just I'm struck by how different all the stories are from what we talked about with um, with what we touched on very lightly the Satanic Panic and also some of the stories that you know that were being bandied about, uh, you know, adjacent to the satanic panic or directly related to it when I was, when I was growing up or in school, right. The exorcism stories that were making mm-hmm. the rounds in the nineties. And that's, that again is a very different devil. So we've got the, the rustic devil who can be tricked. Um, we've got these, these sort of ancient, I guess, I guess Moloch is probably the one that closest, most closely, uh, has made its way into this consciousness as something all powerful that can be still sacrificed to. Um, but I really like, right. And I think, I think the sacrifice is the big thing. Cause again, especially during the satanic panic, that was always the big thing is that there are people performing human sacrifices in basements and out in the woods. And things right. like that. of course the, 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 the other side of that is, how come we don't hear about it in the news? Like how come there aren't, how come there's not all these people that are going missing, right? Like how come? <laughs> sure. Yeah. But I mean, the one, the one we didn't touch on, I feel like is the devil as the great, um, that we see in, you know, in scripture is the devil as the, as the tempter, both, uh, you mm-hmm. know, tempting Christ in the garden and out in the desert. And then also the, the original tempter. And that, that, that seems like another, um, I don't know, extremely useful psychological tool to think of like, like embodying this idea of uh, like all the things that you, that, that you tell yourself, oh, I could do it, you know, I could do it this way, but it's so very different from, uh, I guess the one thing, the one, the one thing that's my bugbear and the, the one reason I think I like, uh, specifically, you know, these, the folkloric devil and, uh, very, I think very specifically Dante's, Dante's Satan who by his own evil, evil just ends up being just, ineffectual 
and then the myopic devil just like gathering little syllables is that how to explain it i don't know it's just also very different from from this idea of of like like a power of darkness that can take over your mind which Mm. was the kind of story that was was very prevalent these exorcism stories which were like you know like i i was i was told some of these as as like actual fact these are here's things that happen these exorcism stories where the devil has taken over somebody right and that has led me to um i mean i don't know i've known people who have felt like oh i've had you know I think like the devil is, is getting into my thoughts, making me say, like saying things like, wait, do it this way, you know, like, and, and maybe that's like the opening door to full on possession, stuff like this, right? Like that, those kind of ideas have, have, have touched my life and they're tremendous. They, those ideas can be tremendously terrifying to people and it's been I don't know. It's it's like I love I love 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 the historian long view, and I like um, looking back on all the different permutations of of this one idea, and and how it's been used metaphorically in different ways. I mean, I think to me, sort of this idea of like, oh, the devil is getting into my thoughts, or the devil is you know tempting me to do things, um, you know. I, I just sort of wonder how much of that is meant to absolve oneself in their own mind of their own, you know, dark thoughts. Yeah. I mean, in my, in my experience though, there, a lot of times it's people who, who want so desperately to be good, right. That mm -hmm. they, 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 when they have a thought that they don't understand or, or feels odd to them, um, they've been told that, you know, that could be a power from outside, right? This is yeah. a terrifying idea. That's a terrifying idea, right? Like to be young and to think like, and to have like, like an inclination that maybe you haven't had before. And instead of like um, looking at yourself and saying, well, what's that about? Um, to yeah. be, to be a part of a, I don't know, to, to have been. I'm not in control. Uh, you know, to be exposed, exposed to the idea that, that, that this could, that it could be another thinking being in your brain, right? Another being that is not you giving you this thought is, is, and, and having been told that as, as like a possible real option. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, like, I grew up with that being a thing a part of like, you know, part of my, part of my, uh, school days was was that being an actual thing. And that's, I feel like, I feel like that's, it's just very different than, than some of the stories that we've been kind of covering. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we could probably do another episode on, I mean, there's so many demons and devils out there, right? Mm, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, that I'm sure we can find, you know, uh, some of those, but uh, yeah, I think in a lot of the more traditional literature of, these demons and devils and things like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, they don't really seem, they don't really seem to sort of have that, that power of like a possession necessarily. And also like a lot of them, um, I don't want to say they don't seem concerned with people, but, um, cause certainly they do, but, uh, you know, it's, it's like, um, again, like we keep saying, it's not sort of that existential, like, someday we are going to take over all the people and turn them all to Satan and send them all right. to hell kind of thing. Right. It's like, it's like we were all, it's almost as if we're living in a, like a, almost like a post Cthulhu, um, HP Lovecraft version of, of some of these ideas. I don't know. Maybe. I yeah. mean, I think that, I think that HP Lovecraft, I think a lot of those stories are probably, some of the first stories again, where it's like, again, this existential threat to humanity from creatures that don't really care about people. Right. They yeah. just care about, you know, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's interesting. And, you know, and again, also this idea of like, um, 
the idea of like very powerful evil entities is sort of in in some respects a little bit of a recent thing right i just think about for example like for example in greek mythology Mm -hmm. you have hades who is the leader of the underworld he's sort of the closest thing that greek mythology maybe has to a satan figure and yet he's not particularly evil right like he's not he's not a tempter necessarily i mean sure he he does some bad things but all the gods do because all of those gods are he's just kind of gothy he does Um, does as much bad things as the other greek gods do and he's got his foibles like they do (laughs) right And, and also the underworld in in that sort of cosmology is not you know, I mean, there are people who get punished down there, but it's right. not seen as, you know, it's it's different from from the Christian concept of hell. Right. Eternal burning. Torture. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are there are people who are far more educated in this than than we are. But um, yeah, it's sort of interesting. The the link between demons and evil and it's sort of like the idea of like are demons creatures who do evil things or are they evil personified? Yeah. 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 All right. Well, um, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good discussion, <laughs> but we're, that's a whole nother one. This is, yeah. this is, this is a, this is a hefty episode. So let's end this episode the way we always do. Uh, what was what was I'll think about what my favorite of yours was and you think about your favorite of mine. Mm-hmm. I think Moloch was too scary. Mm-hmm. I like I really liked learning about Lilith, um, but I think that Baphomet was my favorite. Um, yeah, because I liked uh, I did not. Re- there was a whole bunch of uh, about the the connection to the Knights Templar that I that I was unaware of, and um, and seeing that image of Baphomet interpreted as a as a an image depicting balance, uh, cast it in a new light for me, which I liked a lot. And you said, well, it's not like you know I probably will put an image of Baphomet up in my house, but and then I thought you know, uh, <laughs> Jersey sent me a Prince Adam because Prince Adam. Uh, signify certain things for him and for and for me, you know, of, of, you know, taking time to, you know, enjoy life, you know, uh, the, the, the flip side of, of being He-Man or whatever it is. And so and I put my Prince Adam up there to remind me, you know, to have fun from time to time. And in uh, yeah. that wise, I think you could put up an image, you know, like like some of these things are, are uh are meant to remind you of certain things and and Baphomet really does seem to have an interesting depiction of balance and how and how you should definitely have a male and a female arm I think that's a whole I don't know how that would work that that's, that was the weirdest part for Baphomet for me I mean like oh well <laughs> if you look at the original illustration <laughs> I if you look at the original illustration I will say it does appear that he kind of tried to give one arm has a little bit more of like a defined shoulder Okay. So I don't know if that was sort of the attempt. Some more like, (laughs) uh, some more um, uh, forearm hair, I guess would be. Oh, gosh. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, So my favorite of yours, it's a toss up because I really like the the rustic devil. I'm going to call him Old Scratch. I Mm -hmm. really like, I really like Old Scratch. But also, uh, I'm sorry, what was his name again? Tintibulus. The, the, Tintibulus. the little imp. Tintibulus. I mean, like, it's just was delightful. Really great too. It's just delightful. Yeah, and, and so, like, hyper-specific. Yeah. You know, so, like, hyper-focused on, like, this one little bugaboo. Yeah. Um, But I think I am going to go with Old Scratch. Oh, nice. That's great. With the rustic, the rustic devil. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I like that because he occupies the same he occupies the same fiefdom as sort of like trolls and ogres and, you know, things that are kind of things you might meet on a bridge, you know, setting up a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Very good. All right. Well, well, that was our demons and devils episode, and I don't feel as uh, I don't I don't feel as as dark and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, my mind does not feel molested. Oh, good. Yes, you're not under the deep dark blanket of of uh, of uh, thunder and lightning. No, not, you're not in a spooky castle anymore. I'm gonna open up my no. shutters and let the light in. There we go. I think that's uh, a good idea. Beautiful. <laughs> Sunlight truly is the best disinfectant. Yeah. All right. Well, for Ben Hatke, I'm Zach Giolongo. And for Zach Giolongo, I am Benjamin Margaret Hatke. And we'll see you next time. See you next time. Hey, everyone. David Universe here producer and audio engineer for Ben and Zach's Monster Market. On behalf of the team, thanks for listening. Music for this episode was created by Twinstrumental. If you'd like to see sketches of the creatures discussed on this episode, as well as other mystical goodness, please visit us at monstermarketpod.com, as well as Instagram and Facebook at monstermarketpod. For creature recommendations, or just to say hello, please email us at monstermarketpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, beware, because they be monsters out there. <laughs>